very important with these double text questions to make sure you understand the actual question. In this case, they want to say, uh, want us to figure out what these two texts agree on. Okay, so they might disagree in pretty much everything else, but it's what they agree on that matters. So as I read, I'm trying to keep that in mind. So in this case, I would just go in order. There's no reason to, to flip the order here. In 1916, H. Dugdale Sykes disputed claims the two noble kinsmen was co-authored by William Shakespeare and John Fletcher. Sykes felt Fletcher's contributions to the play were obvious. Fletcher had a distinct style in his other plays, so much so that lines that with that style were considered sufficient evidence of Fletcher's authorship. But for the lines not deemed to be by Fletcher, Sykes felt that their depiction of women indicated that their author was not Shakespeare, but Philip Massinger. Honestly, I don't know what to take away from this. I guess the, the the main idea is at the beginning, he's disputing these claims that it's co-authored by Shakespeare and Fletcher. So, okay, I don't. I, so let's just see what text two says. Uh, Scholars have accepted the two noble kinsmen as co-authored by Shakespeare since the 1970s. It appears in all major one-volume editions of Shakespeare's complete works. Though scholars disagree about who wrote what exactly, it is generally held that on the basis of style, Shakespeare wrote all of the first act and most of the last, while John Fletcher co-authored or authored most of the three middle act. So again, this is about Shakespeare and Fletcher, but this seems to be saying um, that they were co-authors. So these, these passages generally disagree, but again, what do they agree on? I really don't know. Let's look at the choices. A, John Fletcher's writing has a unique, readily identifiable style. Well, they both talk about Fletcher. Uh, is it identifiable? That's a pretty strong word there. Well, Fletcher authored most of the three middle acts. I guess. Um, I mean, is his basis of style, so maybe that's something. The first one said a lot more about Fletcher, right? This whole thing is about Fletcher. Uh, da, da, da. Fletcher had a distinct style. I don't know. I guess that's maybe the answer. Honestly, I wouldn't know just because that seems like such a broad claim, but they definitely both talk about Fletcher, so at least for now, we have to leave that in. Let's take a look at choice B. The women characters in John Fletcher's plays are similar to the women characters in Philip Massinger's plays. Well, this guy isn't even mentioned in Passage 2, so who cares, right? So notice, like this is kind of like a main character issue. Uh, we see that kind of trap in lots of different SAT reading passages, but here it's helpful because we have two passages. So we can just say like, okay, if the person isn't mentioned, that's probably not a good sign. C, the two noble kinsmen belongs in one volume compilations of Shakespeare's complete plays. No, because passage one disagrees with that. Right, it, it says that Shakespeare's not involved. Right, it wasn't him. It was this other guy, Massinger. So why would we put this play in Shakespeare's completed works if it's not by Shakespeare? So this is this is actually getting to the main idea of the passage that they disagree on. D. Philip Massinger's style, not a great sign. In the first and last acts of the two noble kinsmen is an homage to Shakespeare's style. Again, this guy isn't mentioned, so main character issue. So look. In a dumb summary kind of way, both car both passages seem to talk about Fletcher a lot. That seems okay. They do agree that he has a distinct style, right? So they agree that he's part of this this uh, writing of this authorship of this book or play. But um, yeah, I don't know. A, a doesn't stand out as like being obviously right. But that's why we don't spend a lot of time on these things. If we have an obviously wrong answer choice, great, cross it out and move on. And then sometimes we end up just picking whatever's left over. And that's okay. I didn't really have a problem with choice A. I just, I don't know. It wouldn't have been my um, my view, my kind of summary of what they agreed on, mostly because I didn't have one. There's a lot going on in both passages. So I just didn't bother doing that, knowing that the answer choices would do it for me. So remember, don't try to absorb all the information in these two passages. Let the answer choices help you and guide you and tell you what to care about.